Welcome everybody uh, to the first installment of Transportation Tuesday. Here at the top of the hour, I can see a number of people are coming in. Uh, we'll give it one or two more minutes here and then we will get started. All right, I'm going to go ahead and begin. <clears throat> so welcome everyone. My name is Peter Kirsten. Uh, I am a program manager with uh, RTA Strategic Planning. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first installment of the 2023 Transportation Tuesday webinar series. Um, so this is a four part series uh, that brings together RTA staff, uh, regional and some national leaders in transportation planning, economic development, affordable housing, mobility, data analysis to discover trends and topics relevant to the Chicago region. Um, each Tuesday this month will feature a different topic. Uh, so on the 13th, we will cover mobility hubs, um, connecting transportation options for a more seamless experience. On the 20th, transit and industrial corridors, community experience, accessibility, freight interactions. On the 27th, uh, advancing a regional capital strategy how transit is the answer, the, the current strategic plan, and RTA's capital program shaped the maintenance, upkeep, and improvements of transit infrastructure. Uh, today's session, uh, a new era for Chicago transit, adapting service to address changing and unmet needs of riders. Um, pandemic, as we all know, has caused dramatic and lasting shifts in how and when Chicagoans move around the region, as well as laying bare the existing inequities in transportation access. Um, a growing portion of residents work from home full time or in hybrid environments with occasional trips to the office. Others travel to work or school at locations that lack access for frequent bus or rail service, um, especially during the mid midday overnight hours. So these realities incentivize transit agencies and local governments to rethink the traditional model that primarily serves nine to five Monday through Friday commuters and to test new and innovative ways to deliver transit service to people when and where they need it. So today we'll hear from transit agency staff about how they are changing and adapting transit in their area to meet the changing needs of riders and address long unmet needs of communities. We have three presentations today. Um, we will have time at the end for Q&A. Uh, you can submit your questions via the chat feature. We do ask that people stay on mute though uh, during the presentations. So with us today are uh, David Kralik and Daniel Majdanski from Metra, Eric Llewellyn from PACE, and Sonali Tandon from CTA. I would be re remiss not to mention that four out of five people speaking, myself included, are graduates of the Urban Planning and Policy Master's Program at the University of Illinois Chicago, also known as MUPS. So four out of five is pretty good. We'll try to get five next time. Um, I'm really excited to hear from the panelists today. Each of the three service boards are represented covering all modes of public transit operated across the six counties uh, that the regional system serves. <clears throat> so we'll hear today about exciting projects and pilots charting the course for the system of the future, a system that meets the changing and uh, uh, unmet needs of our region. Lastly, uh, this webinar uh, ties in to the newly adopted regional transit strategic plan Transit is the answer. So if you're someone who engages with the RTA regularly, you've likely heard us talk about this or even participated in developing the plan through surveys, workshops, or as a stakeholder in a working group. Um, it goes without saying that the pandemic has had profound impacts on many elements of society. Um, transit has not been spared from funding challenges to driver shortages and disruptions uh, to personal safety and security. Um, transit, like many, many industries has been greatly impacted. So this is a time of change, and while much is uncertain, Transit is the Answer articulates a vision, guiding principles, and an agenda for advocacy and action. You can read more, read more about the plan um, at the link that is in the chat. 
Uh, today's presentations are going to be focused on action, actions that the service boards are taking to better address changing and long met uh, mobility needs for our region. So first we'll hear from Metro about their efforts to advance a regional rail service model uh, moving toward a system that serves commuters as well as off-peak riders. Uh, second, we'll hear from PACE on a host of planning, service, and technology initiatives they are undertaking to more holistically address mobility needs for suburban riders. Uh, and then last, we'll hear from CTA on progress to advance extending the red line to the far southern reach of the city of Chicago. This is a project that has long sought to connect far south side communities and once complete will be a truly transformational asset to the south side of the city offering access to downtown Chicago, healthcare, education, recreational opportunities. So with that, uh, I will stop talking and pass it to David and Daniel from Metro. Thanks, PK. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Kralik, Director of Planning and Programming at Metro, and I'm joined by Dan Miodonsky, our Senior Manager of Operations Planning and Analysis. And we're really excited to share Metro's strategic vision of regional rail with you today. Next slide. A year and a half ago, back in late 2021, as we were still in the midst of the COVID pandemic, Metro determined that it would be the right time to take stock and chart our future path. In 2018, we had adopted our agency's first ever strategic plan called On Track to Excellence. Now that plan focused on our operating and capital funding needs, but the end of that plan's five-year horizon was fast approaching. And it was time for us to revisit our strategic plan. We knew we were dealing with a dramatically different world than we were when we developed the first plan, with challenges ranging from new and changing travel patterns, changes in operating and capital funding needs, calls to be more responsive to equity and climate change, all while working in the most complex railroad operating environment in North America, and still trying to attract and retain employees to provide a central transit service. So in response, we developed a new plan. My Metro, our future, to set our course for the next five years and respond to those persistent challenges. Next slide. We started by building on the value that we provide to the region. From connecting people to destinations, providing an alternative to driving, contributing to sustainable land use development and reducing the region's greenhouse gas emissions, we help attract businesses to the region and create jobs, save riders time and money, and reduce traffic congestion. Through all of this, we knew we had a strong base to build on. Next slide. So we started with a good sense of who we are, uh, who we were and who we are. Our mission is to provide safe, reliable, efficient and affordable commuter rail service that enhances the economic and environmental health of Northeast Illinois. Commuter rail uh, focuses on work trips in the downtown core. Of course, other types of travel were always possible on Metra but nine to five Monday to Friday trips were really our bread and butter. So we came through the changes of the pandemic and heard calls to become something more than just commuter rail. Next slide. We developed a vision statement of what we aspire to. To proactively address evolving transportation needs, Metro will provide regional rail service that supports sustainable connected communities. The table here details some characteristics and distinctions between commuter rail and regional rail. Essentially, regional rail provides service at regular intervals with consistent stopping patterns throughout the day, not just oriented around bringing commuters into the urban center. While significant rush hour service will still be present, we wanna to evolve to become an all day transportation option for many different trip types throughout the region. Next slide. As part of this plan, we identified five strategic goals and regional rail is key to each of them. Next slide. Enhancing service to grow ridership and provide mobility choices is one of the aims of regional rail. And if we offer more memorable schedules and regular stopping, stopping patterns, we can ensure that the Metro experience is safe, easy, and enjoyable for all our customers. Providing consistent service to all parts of the region will help us to attract and retain a diverse workforce and to invest in our employees. And our movement towards regional rail, while maybe more common in other parts of the world, is truly an innovation for us that will allow us to become more efficient and effective. Providing consistent service throughout the region is a key element of our commitment to equity and sustainability. 
So now I'll turn it over to Damian Donsky to talk about what we're doing in terms of bringing the regional rail vision into reality with a focus on our schedules. Next slide. Can you ever hear me okay? Excellent. So just like speak a little bit of how the strategic plan efforts complements our service planning efforts here at Metro. So during the pandemic, as I'm sure we're all well aware, we had to cut service pretty drastically. We actually went to our um, basically our snow schedules, which operate about 50% of the service in terms of number of trains, but still provide core, core service for working hours and to make sure the essential workers had transportation options. But during that, as after we kind of transitioned to those extreme weather type schedules, we were working on longer term schedules that anticipated both change in travel patterns to kind of recognize the fact that, you know, the peak wasn't as peaky as before. You know, the rush hour had less in demand due to the work from home trend, which the pandemic certainly accelerated and also incorporates them the longer term service goals that complements the strategic plan efforts, which David just mentioned. And in order to you know, put these principles, these ideas into paper, we've established surface uh, service principles um, to, to, to focus our thinking across um, across the lines because there's 11 lines in Metro. So um, please, next slide. So here are service principles that actually guided our thinking, as I mentioned, to as we put you know new new schedules in practice. Uh, number one, consistent and frequent service throughout the day. Again, very complementary with the strate strategic plan efforts. Um, easily understandable with memorable service patterns. Um, just before pre-pandemic, for a variety of reasons, some of the uh, metro service patterns didn't necessarily have a um, a schedule which would be easy for customer or employees to, to to memorize. We try to make sure that moving forward as much as possible that we have service patterns that are easy to memorize on regular frequencies. Um, again, just kind of combining the different types of trains that we have. Next is uh, including new express service when possible. Uh, it's not always possible based on infrastructure, but we certainly know that our customers uh, do appreciate express service whenever the infrastructure allows it. Uh, consider transfers with the, both within Metra and other transit agencies. Um, again, so one of the kind of initial steps we took was to recalibrate some of our midday trains so you can actually transfer and connect to other lines within the same terminal. Um, explore reverse commute and new ridership markets. Again, that kind of plays into the idea that we knew that our traditional uh, commuters, the, the, they're still there certainly, but maybe not as big a numbers as, as pre-COVID. And then lastly, promote regional equity. So we we'll make sure we're applying these across all of our lines across this, this very large region of ours. So next, next slide, please. So we've actually, um, you know, we've, we've become, started implementing these pilot schedules, uh, which are kind of our first initial steps in incorporating these service principles, some of the ideas behind the strategic plan. Um, and, and many of the, the pilot schedules actually have some of the, the again, the first steps of more, more midday service, um, more, more regular frequencies and service patterns. In fact, on four of our lines, we're running more midday service than essentially you've ever had before. Uh, the UP North, um, for example, we can experiment with half hour, hourly headways during uh, the midday and pre-COVID, there was um, you know a two-hour gap midday. So it's something we've actually you know closed that gap uh, more than we've ever had in certainly in my time working here for ten years. Uh, UP Northwest was another another um, line we recently uh, closed a, a larger gap in the midday. Uh, BNSF, our busiest line that connects to Aurora, that now has no more two-hour gaps midday. And then lastly, the Rock Island District, we've. Uh, and it's an express service midday, so keeping that hourly frequency, but for both branches or two branches on the on the Rock Island district. So again, these are our first initial steps that we're taking to um, to really implement some of these this, this thinking as much as we can, kind of in the near term, given our you know, uh, crew and infrastructure and uh, consist or equipment that is uh, constraints. And that actually leads into uh, two more uh, efforts we'd like to speak about. So next slide, please. Uh, the first one is this uh, route restoration study. It is a um, FTA funded study that we're looking at kind of big data, quote unquote. Uh, so basically um, using location service data uh, to see where people are actually traveling within the region. So the purpose of the study is to see if there's any markets that we can uh, maybe go after that are either along a metro line or connecting to metro line. So kind of these near term service changes given our um, existing infrastructure, rolling stock, a cruise, something that again, near-term service could help maybe guide our thinking for um, as we're coming out of the pandemic and as we're shaping our schedules. Again, kind of looking at where people are traveling across all modes, not just transit, and seeing if there's any way we can enhance our schedules, again, to kind of explore those new markets, one of those service principles we discussed earlier. On the second initiative, I believe I'll hand it back over to David. So next slide. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so the second effort is what we're calling our metro system-wide network plan. 
Uh, this will build on the results of the route restoration study that Dan mentioned before. Uh, it'll help us determine how we can evolve to better serve those new and changing travel markets in the decades to come. So the results will guide our, both our capital investments and our operations over the uh, next 20 years. But unlike the route restoration study, the system-wide network plan won't be limited by existing infrastructure and rolling stock. It'll allow us to develop and test some more advanced regional rail concepts, like more robustly serving destinations like O'Hare Airport, and also connecting with future Amtrak service. Next slide. The third initiative we have underway works to ensure that we have the land use and customers to take advantage of regional rail service, because if you don't have the people there and the land use to support it, it's just not going to work. So we're actively reevaluating commuter parking demand at our outlying stations and developing an approach to transit oriented development and commuter, commuter parking. This effort will allow us to better respond to community inquiries and provide consistent standards to evaluate redevelopment opportunities. This will continue and extend our ongoing coordination on TOD planning efforts. It will identify areas where we have excess parking that may be good candidates for redevelopment or potential land swaps, and also help us make sure that the response we're providing to community and developer proposals that are coming in, so we started to get more and more of these, um, that we're providing a consistent response to those going forward. Next slide. So, Achieving this vision of regional rail will not be easy. We cannot simply flip a switch and become a regional rail operator. It's gonna take us more funding to operate the level of service we used to operate, let alone the increased service levels that are needed to re fully realize uh, our vision of regional rail. We'll need, to, uh, we'll need transit support of land use and strong first and last mile connections. And we'll need the cooperation of our freight rail partners and other key stakeholders to make all of this happen. So thanks for the opportunity to chat with you about this this afternoon, and we look forward to taking your questions later on. Thank you, David and Daniel. Up next, we have Eric Llewellyn from PACE. And as a reminder, again, uh, we do wanna have time for Q&A at the end, so please submit questions via the chat. Uh, Eric, over to you. Thank you. As mentioned previously, my name is Eric Llewellyn and I am PACE's Chief Planning Officer. Today I'll be providing a brief overview on pandemic's impacts on PACE services, how PACE is transforming service and using technology to meet the new post-pandemic realities, and how PACE plans to address future service needs in the region. Next slide, please. PACE is tasked with serving the suburban six-county region of Northeastern Illinois, an area that covers over 3,600 square miles, is nearly the size of the state of Connecticut and about 15 times the size of the city of Chicago. Given the geographic size and diversity of land uses that exist in the communities within the PACE service area, PACE has always had to operate a range of public transportation services. This includes fixture buses, on-demand various vanpool programs, ADA and paratransit services, along with numerous other innovative alternative services. When the pandemic struck, all PACE services were impacted in some way. However, some services were affected more than others and in different ways. PACE's mainline fixed route service, which typically operates on arterial roadways, linking key transportation nodes with important destinations throughout the region, did see ridership declines during the pandemic, but at a lower rate than other service types. Routes such as the Pulse Milwaukee Line, expressway-based services, and other arterial bus routes continued to provide essential trips throughout the pandemic and were used by essential workers throughout the region. For example, on Route 352, which is PACE's busiest route, ridership only declined by 30% and continued to carry approximately 3,000 riders each weekday. Additionally, there were some routes that saw an increase in ridership during the pandemic. Nearly all of these routes served distribution and logistics centers, which were thriving during the pandemic as people switched to using e-commerce. The users of, the, of these routes were workers traveling during non-traditional work hours. However, other PACE routes, such as weekday peak-only commuter routes, which focused on serving the traditional nine to five commuter market, saw significant ridership declines. Ridership on commuter focused services, specifically those that serve Metra, declined 97% as most commuters shifted to working from home. Over 65 commuter routes in total were suspended and eventually discontinued as it became apparent that working from home and hybrid work schedules would continue. Prior to the pandemic, the most successful commuter routes were those that offered an alternative park to parking at a Metro station with very limited parking capacity. 
Today, parking lots at the busiest outlying metro stations have parking availability on most days. A similar situation occurred with basic van pool programs. Programs that focus specifically on the traditional work commuter saw a steep decline in ridership activity during the pandemic. Another challenge brought about by the pandemic is the impact on operator availability. Transit agencies across the country, including PACE, had to contend with limited operator resources, which has impacted service availability across service modes, including fixed route and ADA paratransit service. It was made clear during the pandemic that changes were needed to bring riders back to the system, better align services to meet the new service realities, and to, re to create a more equitable transit system. Next slide, please. To better match the post-pandemic service needs of riders, PACE has implemented or is working on a number of initiatives to improve service offerings, to leverage technology to make it easier to use PACE services, and to look holistically at how suburban transit services provided. Shown here is a list of some of these initiatives, which I will now provide a little more detail on. Next slide, please. Beginning in January of 2022, PACE implemented its first TNC pilot project, the DuPage Uber Access Program. For eligible riders in DuPage County, this optional service is a user side subsidy, providing an additional travel alternative for ADA riders. A rider is charged $2, and PACE will subsidize the trip up to $30. Approximately 3,400 trips are provided each month through this program. In December of 2022, PACE launched its second TNC pilot project with USER. As part of this program, certified ADA riders can select this option when making their booking. Approximately 3,500 trips are provided each month through this program. It should be noted that ridership on ADA services has already re returned to pre-pandemic levels, despite the fact that there are fewer operators available today to run the service. Both of these services allow PACE to provide additional service capacity to help with operator shortages, provides additional flexibility for the rider, and lower operational costs for PACE in the region. Next slide, please. Even with the rise in telecommuting and hybrid work schedules, there is still a need to provide first, last mile service options. Beginning in 2022, PACE launched a new Vanpool pilot project called Van Gogh. Van Gogh is a reservation-based service in which drivers and passengers mm -hmm. reserve a spot in advance for the next business day. This new pilot program provides a first last mile transit option for commuters traveling round trip mm -hmm. to the Lakeworth Metro Station in Deerfield, the Lake Forest UP North Line Station, and the Palatine Metro Station to nearby work locations. Mm -hmm. Future service will be available in the Itasca area from the Itasca Metro Station and the CTA Blue Line Rosemont Station. To use the service, passengers can email or call to reserve their trip at least one day in advance. Services available, available between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. with trips starting and ending in a designated service area. Upon arriving at the chosen metro station, the customer is given a code that unlocks the vehicle which they can use to travel to the destination. At the end of the day, the customer returns the vehicle to the same location they picked it up from. The fare is $5 round trip. Drivers carrying pre-registered riders are free. Participants in the Van Gogh program will use a late model van, often a Dodge Van Caravan or Ford Transit van. Next slide, please. PACE's on-demand service is a reservation-based shared ride service operating in 10 designated service areas throughout the suburban region. Passengers book online or call to reserve their trip at least one hour or up to seven days in advance. PACE on-demand is open to the general public and trips must begin and end within the selected on-demand zone. The fare is $2 per one-way ride when using a rental card. Customers can also use passes such as the PACE 30-day pass or pay with cash. All vehicles are ADA accessible. Part of a pilot project that began in June of 2022, PACE roughly doubled the size of the previous Naperville Aurora on-demand service area from 10 square miles to 22 square miles. Service operates between the hours of 6.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. on weekdays only. With this service expansion, PACE was able to provide alternative service options for a number of the weekday peak-only commuter routes that were discontinued in this area. This expansion has also been able to provide flexible all-day service to a larger portion of the Naperville area, and provided an opportunity to serve other markets that have not traditionally been served, such as the weekday off-peak period. Since the expansion was implemented, ridership increased 120% from an average of 23 riders per weekday to 51 riders per weekday, meeting service expectations. As a result, PACE has made these changes permanent. Next slide, please. Partnerships with TNCs may offer an opportunity to provide cost-effective first and last mile service better service suburban mobility needs in areas where traditional fixed route service may not be as productive, and supplement existing pace service or fill-in service gaps. Pace has traditionally operated very limited transit service during overhand hours. Only one pace route, Route 352, 
operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Most routes do not operate at all between 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. Though demand for transit service is lower during these hours, this lack of even basic overnight transit service presents a challenge for some shift workers and job seekers. A TNC may be able to provide this missing late night link. To test the effectiveness of this type of service, PACE will be implementing a new pilot project called PACE Connect, a late night first and last mile service that will operate in two locations, the O'Hare South Cargo area and the Greater Harvey area. The service would be operated by VIA. The O'Hare South Cargo area has several 24 hour facilities that support freight, mail, and cargo operations at the airport. Existing pay service is available and connects employees at these facilities to the CTA Blue Line at Rosemont, which operates 24 hour service. However, some shifts fall completely outside of current, the current route's hours of operation, and workers cannot connect with the CTA Blue Line during the overnight period. The Pace Connect O'Hare South Cargo Pilot will operate daily between the hours of 11.30 p.m. and 5.30 a.m., filling in the service gap during this time period. Only trips between the CTA Blue Line Rosemont Station and the designated zone south of O'Hare will be eligible for service. Customers will be charged a fare of $2 for each trip and would be able to use a credit card or prepaid debit card for fare payment. Wheelchair accessible minivans will be used for the service. Next slide, please. Between the CTA Red Line, Dan Ryan 95th Street Station and the Harvey Transportation Center, Route 352 operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. During the overnight hours, the Harvey Transportation Center serves as the southern terminus for Route 352, but connecting pay service is unavailable during this time period, limiting first and last mile connection opportunities for workers. The Pace Connect Greater Harvey Area Pilot will serve Harvey and some or all of nine other South Suburban communities. This service will operate Monday through Friday between the hours of 12 a.m. and 6 a.m. and on Saturday, Sunday, and holidays between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., filling in the connecting service gap during these time periods. Eligible trips will only be available within the designated zone, and at least one end of the trip must either start or end at the Harvey Transportation Center. Similar to the Pace Connect O'Hare Self Cargo Pilot, customers will be charged a fare of $2 for each trip, and will be able to use a credit card or prepaid debit card for fare payment. Wheelchair accessible minivans will be used for the service. Both services are anticipated to start this summer. Next slide, please. When operating in alternative service types, different technologies may be used to provide the service. This can create a situation in which service information is difficult to find for certain service types, and customers are unable to easily get information about opportunities to connect or use other available services. In June of 2022, PACE approved a partnership with TransitApp for a two-year pilot to develop mobility as a service, or MOS, integrations for PACE. MOS aims to make it easier to get around without a car and to extend the reach of the PACE network by aggregating information on different PACE offerings, such as on-demand and other PACE services. TransitApp is a mobile app that aggregates and maps real-time public transit data, as well as crowdsourced user data, to provide the most accurate information for anyone making a public transit trip. PACE's partnership with Transit App allows customers to be able to access real-time departure information, conduct multimodal trip planning, see crowdsource information, and receive trip cancellation notifications, all from a single application. Future features will include providing customers with service alerts. Another development that is currently underway is the integration of PACE's on-demand service in the app. This develop development would make it easier for customers to be able to discover the service, see what service options are available and where, get in-app information, make the booking experience easier, and provide real-time departure information. The screenshot on this slide shows a mock-up of what integrating on-demand in the transit app may look like. Next slide, please. While the future of MOS is still in development, PACE will continue to take an active role in developing and implementing new features. One future development we hope to implement is the incorporation of paratransit services into the app. Currently, paratransit services are siloed within agencies around the country, with passengers having to make separate arrangements for rides. Working with transit, we plan to allow passengers to begin discovering paratransit trips, part of their trip planning efforts, in addition to other pay services that provide additional options. Other future developments could include things like beach tour information to allow passengers to better plan for unexpected changes to our routes, ticketing and other fare-related integrations, deeper integrations with TNCs and taxi companies, and many more possibilities. The screenshot on this slide highlights a mock-up of the detour feature that Transit is working on implementing within their app. Next slide, please. PACE has identified a network of corridors for arterial rapid transit lines, which we have branded as Pulse. Pulse provides fast, frequent, and reliable bus service using the latest technology and streamlined route design with the goal of improving suburban travel options throughout the region. 
Pace's first line, the Pulse Milwaukee line, was implemented in 2019 and operates along Milwaukee Avenue between the Golf Mills Shopping Center in Niles and the Jefferson Park Transit Center in Chicago. Pace is currently constructing the, the Pulse Dempster line, shown in red on this map, part of our continuing efforts to invest in mainline fixtures service. Five additional corridors have been identified for near-term development, including 95th Street, Halstead Street, Cermak Road, Harlem Avenue, and Roosevelt Road. Benefits of Pulse include faster bus travel and greater frequencies, connections to major destinations and improved links to other bus routes and transit services, bike and ped connectivity and ADA accessibility improvements, improved reliability due to new technology like transit signal priority, and enhanced stations with passenger amenities, including modern heated shelters and Wi-Fi on buses. Next slide, please. Due to the impacts of the pandemic, Pace has seen an unexpected and significant change in travel behavior, ridership, revenue, and staffing levels. Now more than ever, there is a need to reassess how service is provided and to develop a regional service network based on existing and projected future market demand that provides the appropriate level of service for each travel market in an equitable manner. Pace will be, Pace will be working with a consultant to conduct a system-wide network revitalization and system-wide restructuring the initiative. The primary goals of this initiative are to better understand current and future travel needs, to create a service standards framework to guide equitable service investments, and to make system-wide service recommendations based on an evaluation of the market data and the service standards that are developed. Expected outcomes of this project are the development of a new service network that focuses on equity, improves access, prioritizes investments in key services, while also identifying alternative service options for areas where traditional fixture service can't be supported. This project will begin in 2023 and is expected to be completed in approximately 24 months. And with that, that concludes my presentation and I will turn it over to CTA and Sonali. Thank you, Eric. Um, again, keep on sending questions into the chat. And uh, Sonali, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sonali Tandon, Senior Manager for Strategic Planning Rail at CTA, and thanks for joining today. So I'll be talking about the Red Line Extension Project. Um, equity is one of the core principles that has guided RTA's strategic plan, Transit is the Answer. And um, Red Line Extension Project is a transformative equity project that would improve transit service for historically underserved, low-income and minority communities on the far south side of Chicago. The project also addresses one of the action items in the RTA strategic plan, which is to consider racial equity and mobility justice in the regional capital program. Next slide. Red line is the backbone of the CTA rail system. It is one of the handful of US transit lines that runs 24 seven, and it carries about 30% um, of CTA rail customers on an average weekday. CTA's Red Ahead program is a comprehensive initiative for maintaining, modernizing, and expanding Chicago's most traveled rail line. Um, as you can see on the slide, four projects have been completed, including Red Line South, which involved track reconstruction and station rehabilitation, 95th Street Terminal reconstruction, Clark and Division Station, Wilson Station. And then there are three projects that are currently in different stages of planning and construction. Red Line Extension Project, which will be moving to design and construction um, soon, and then Red and Purple Modernization Phase 1 Project, which is under construction. We are currently also working on the planning study for future phases of the Red and Purple Modernization Project, also known as RPM. Next slide. Far South Side has been advocating for an extension since the opening of the Dan Ryan branch in 1969, where the red line was extended to 95th Street. Today, this is the only area where CTA's rail rapid transit service stops short of the city border. The red line extension project fulfills this long unmet need. Next slide. For those that are not very familiar with the project, it will extend red line from its current terminal. 90, at 95th Street, 230th, near Algold Gardens, which is one of the first public housing developments ever built in the US. This 5.6 mile extension will include four new fully accessible stations at 103rd Street, 111th Street, Michigan Avenue, and 130th Street. Each station will have multimodal connections, uh, which will include bus, bike, pedestrian, and park and ride facilities. 
elevated tracks um, will be built from 95th to 119th Street, and um, they will be ground level from 119th Street to 130th Street. Also a modern, efficient rail car storage yard and maintenance facility um, will be built at 120th Street. Third line extension project will be one of the most critical and transformative equity investments in CTA's history. Next slide. This slide shows conceptual renderings of all four new stations. Uh, these renderings are from our video and are included here for illustrative purposes only to give you an idea of the scale and neighborhood presence of these stations. The actual designs may vary. Next slide. Some of the key benefits of the Red Line Extension Project include equity, frequent rail service that will reduce commute times, connectivity to the entire CTA rail network, economic opportunity, and meeting our critical climate and sustainability goals by improving transit. I'll be discussing some of these benefits in depth in the next few slides. Next slide. This slide highlights the current inequities in access to jobs and opportunities. What these two maps show is that similar transit access has less reach to opportunities on the south and west sides because jobs are located furthest from these areas. The left map shows how much of the CTA service area can be reached within 45 minutes by transit. The right map shows the number of jobs reachable within 45 minutes by transit and walking. People in the darkest red area in the map on right can reach over 1 million jobs. And people in the lightest yellow area can only reach under 50,000 jobs within 45 minutes. While the map here shows only jobs, access to other opportunities also looks similar. People living in the RLE project area have some of the biggest, longest commutes in the region. According to census, commute times were 25% longer for residents within this portion than the seven county regional average. This is largely due to our regional land use patterns and related to Chicago's segregation and disinvestment on the south and west sides. Next slide. RLE will provide far south side residents with access to reliable and frequent rail service by saving up to 30 minutes off the average trip from 130th station to the loop, addressing the need that I um, discussed on the previous slide. The project also provides connectivity and access to the entire CTA rail network, meaning customers will be able to board at one of the four new stations and transfer to other trains at one of the many transfer points along the rail line or transfer to a CTA bus. This is really important because currently fewer than 30% of the riders who board at the 95th terminal end their trips in the loop. Most riders are going other places throughout the city, including other south side destinations, further north and downtown or to west side, as you can see in the table on the slide. Next slide. In addition to providing connections to CTA's other rail lines, the RLE will result in other mobility improvements in the area, including adjustment to bus routes and improving pedestrian and bicycle connections. Currently, all bus routes feed into the 95th Street Terminal. With RLE, some of the bus routes will need to be restructured for more efficient connections to new stations with bus stops and facilities located near new station entrances to facilitate easy transfers. And then multiple CTA and base bus routes are expected to serve Michigan and 130th stations um, and expanding the reach of those stations. Um, the um, 130th station will also provide additional transit options for residents through these bus routes connecting to the terminal. And based on travel demand modeling, we expect that about half of the riders would access these new stations by bus. This project will also improve pedestrian access with sidewalk and lighting improvements in immediate vicinity of stations as part of the project, pedestrian crossing treatments at stations and pedestrian safety features in the vicinity. And finally, bike access improvements will make biking to stations an active transportation option. Um, the project will include bike parking at all stations, and we are coordinating with CDOT on other bike access improvement. Next slide. 
already has equity at its foundation. Project area population is predominantly African-American and 24% of the residents live below the poverty level compared to the city average of 19%. The project would improve mobility for transit dependent residents in the area where over 22% of the households lack access to an automobile. This is not only a huge quality of life change, it also brings more jobs within a reasonable commute. We expect that 25,000 additional jobs would become accessible within a 45 minute commute from, from the RLE project area. And the chart to the right shows that 53% additional jobs would become accessible for low income residents and 47% for all residents during peak hours. Additionally, the project is estimated to deliver economic benefits through construction jobs and then through operations and maintenance jobs. Next slide. In addition to improving access to destinations outside of the neighborhood, we want to utilize the transit investment to help catalyze growth and development within the neighborhoods. From MPC's Transit Means Business Report, we know that transit investment catalyzes um, residential and commercial development and increases property value. In fact, from their report in um, 2017, 85% of commercial construction in the region occurred within a half mile of CTA or metro stations. And from our internal analysis, the RLE is anticipated to catalyze 1.7 billion in real estate activity around the stations. In order to proactively plan for future community and economic development around the stations and leverage this multi-billion dollar transit investment, CTA working in partnership with city's um, planning department spearheaded the transit supportive development plan. The Cook County Land Bank Authority also has been an important stakeholder. The plan was recently adopted by Plan Commission on May 18 and will act as a guide for future development in the communities located within the Red Line Extension Project area. The TSD plan outlines a framework for bringing equitable transit-oriented development around the future RLE stations and more broadly into the communities that these stations will serve. It is the culmination of significant community engagement, agency coordination, and technical analysis over the past few years. Next slide. The plan provides a community-driven vision for each station area. These renderings provide a glimpse of those visions centered around catalytic development and opportunity sites near the stations. These visions and recommendations in the plan will foster, foster economic development in the project area. Um, and if you haven't already, we encourage you to take a look at the plan on our website that is listed on the top here, transitchicago.com slash RLE slash TSD. Next slide. We have been deploying a variety of outreach methods to reach residents. This in includes adapting during the pandemic, and we have held stakeholder meetings and listening sessions, project advisory council meetings, community meetings, and attended a number of local events. Use our website, eBlast, social media to share project updates and information. CTA has also partnered with local groups to help promote and distribute meeting notices through door flyers, et cetera. We'll continue to do this and more as the project develops. CTA recently announced the shortlist of design build contractors and several meet and greet events are planned with the proposing firms to network with potential um, DBE firms and small business contractors. Next slide. Over the last several years, CTA has accelerated progress on this project and laid the groundwork for significant federal dollars to come to Chicago to help make this 3.6 billion project a reality. We entered the project development phase of the federal New Stars Capital Investment Grant Program in late 2020. And as shown in this graphic um, on the, in the box to the left, um, we have completed several milestones that includes procurement of advanced work, um, NEPA environmental analysis. We published the final environmental impact statement for the project last year, um, completed 30% design, 
and then um, received transitive approval in December of 2022. Um, the new transit tax increment financing district will help fund 959 million um, in local funding for the project, which shows the city commitment for this project. And recently, on March 9, 2023, FTA assigned the early project and overall new starts project rating of medium high, uh, which is really good, and then recommended that Congress appropriate 350 million in um, 2024 CIG funding. This is a huge accomplishment for this important project. Uh, we are nearing completion of uh, the new starts project development phase and then entering into um, the looking forward to enter into the engineering phase soon. And then after that, um, we hope to bring the designers and contractors on board through the phase two procurement process. And construction is anticipated to start in 2025 uh, with service delivery in 2029, assuming that all the funding milestones are met. So all of the effort we have made to advance this project over the last several years has positioned us very well to take advantage of um, funding made available for projects like this uh, at the federal level. Next slide. MPC's study on cost of segregation ranked Chicago as fifth in the nation in their combined measure of racial and economic segregation. The study noted that segregation holds back the entire region's economy and potential. RLE is an equitable investment that supports a stronger Chicago region by increasing affordable, reliable mobility options that not only benefits the far south side, but the entire red line system. And finally, RLE aligns with the federal administration's focus on equity-based projects and is a prime example and candidate for this type of federal investment. And uh, last slide, please. So with that, thanks everyone. Thanks for listening and for your time today. Thank you, Sonali. Uh, thank you again, Eric. Thank you again, Daniel and David. Um, we do have uh, a few minutes remaining here um, for some q and I can see that there are a number in the chat. Um, I'm gonna start the Q&A uh, with a question about engagement. Um, that I will pose uh, to all of the presenters, and maybe we can just go back in the order uh, that we presented, starting with Metra. Um, so engagement is a, a critical tool in understanding the needs of the communities that we serve. This is particularly true now when people's needs for travel, mobility are shifting. Um, can each of you speak to how your agency has or plans to uh, engage with communities um, in advancing uh, the projects or some element of the projects that you shared about today. Um, so Metro, we'll start with you guys. Sure, thanks, PK. Uh, so during the strategic plan development, we conducted several surveys uh, to kind of get information and preferences from the public and had pretty wide success with those and also got feedback on specific elements of the plan. Uh, we also uh, rolled out a, a, a third survey that was specific to when people were looking to travel, got information about uh, how, uh, how we could translate that and have build up a database of information about uh, preferred uh, options uh, that can inform our scheduled development. And then in terms of looking forward, the uh, system-wide network plan effort that I mentioned um, is going to include a couple of rounds of public outreach as we go through that. So we'll be looking to have one of those uh, later this year and then another um, later in the process uh, as we develop those. Dan, I don't know if you wanna speak a little bit about kind of what we do uh, to communicate when we roll out new schedules. Oh, sure, yeah, just to, to build on what David said, we did actually uh, conduct a survey as well um, during the pandemic to kind of just get a pulse on what people were thinking, you know, travel times, days of the week coming downtown, that sort of thing. Uh, we also consistently um, monitor our, our feedback channels, you know, social media, uh, the website. Um, anytime there's a, you know, we, we change schedules, we were very, very paid close attention to what, you know, folks are saying about it. Um, we talk to our crews as well. We're actually in the operations department, so in the same department that the, you know, because we have onboard personnel, so they'll often hear feedback too. So wide variety of things. Um, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily intuitive for people to uh, comment on schedules because it's just kind of something they they use. They don't necessarily think about it, but 
uh, whenever we do change schedules, we, we definitely try to get as much feedback as possible and um, we're constantly revising schedules. I think we've changed the schedules um, the last three years more than my you know, first seven or maybe Metro's history uh, as the pandemic has evolved and as we've kind of grappled with this with work, work, work from home transition. So um, yeah, it's something that we are, I'd say just kind of an ongoing process. At Pace, I'll kind of speak in generalities because we had a, a, a wide variety of projects that we, we showed today. But Pace has an ex, has extensive outreach efforts, which aim to meet people where they are, whether it be in person, online, on board, or at home. So before any major changes are made, public input is sought on the proposed changes. Initial feedback may be received through work, public outreach activities. Public hearing or hearings are held prior to any major changes being brought to the Pace board for approval. We also have staff that regularly meet with a variety of interested stakeholders in the region to get their input on PACE services. This includes writers, businesses, communities, elected officials, and other key stakeholders. I did see a, a question in the chat about whether or not we engage with local chambers of commerce. That's certainly something that we do. We have staff that can regularly go out and, and meet with uh, interested parties to provide information about all the different service types that we, we do operate. We use both traditional and modern methods to communicate to various stakeholders. As, as an example, we have a transit ambassador program in which staff goes out to transit centers and rides bus routes to engage with riders. For riders who, who subscribe to alerts, Pace uses a .gov delivery to notify riders electronically about changes or other important information. Pace website is regularly updated and contains information about all of our key programs and projects and has ways for individuals to communicate directly with Pace staff. To make sure that outreach materials are accessible, we provide translation and sign language services. We, we try to make sure that meetings are accessible by transit and that facilities are accessible to all patrons. And, and finally, we, we survey riders to get their feedback on how the system is performing and to get their feedback on how we can make the system better. Um, again, that's just a general overview of some of the different ways in which we engage with people. Um, sometimes there's more targeted outreach efforts depending on the, the nature of the project, but that's, that's sort of a general overview. And speaking for the um, CTA's Red Line Extension project, um, community engagement and ownership has been a critical component of the work that we are um, during the environmental review process, as well as um, in the development of the Transit Supportive Development Plan. And um, this will continue to be a key for the success of the project as we move to construction. As I discussed in my present presentation, we have used different ways and tools to reach people, both by meeting where they are, and then also social media and virtual channels. Um, just a number of ways trying to, um, trying to um, get to people and get their feedback and also provide them project information. We are continuing to explore new and innovative ways of community outreach. Um, we recently received a federal grant to develop a locally led engagement plan for the project, which will support CTA's existing outreach efforts by outlining strategies to better reach people where they are, um, hopefully uh, working with some of the community advocates and then ensuring broad awareness of the project and building community ownership um, as we move forward. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, all three, for that thoughtful response. Um, I'm going to ask another question here, and I'm going to. There's uh, uh, quite a few questions in the chat. I'm going to try and cover a couple in uh, the way that we frame this question. Before that, though, I'm going to answer one uh, easy one, which is what is the best way to check for notice of upcoming changes. Um, so on the screen, you can see the ways that the RTA communicates. Uh, we, we repost a lot of things that the service boards are communicating through social media channels. That is a great place to start. You can also find um, information on the RTA blog. Uh, you can sign up uh, for uh, the, the regional transit newsletter as well, um, or find uh, the service boards directly on social media for updates on these projects and more. Um, so the second question, um, kind of covers uh, a, a topic that a lot of people are getting at in the chat, and it is kind of the challenges uh, to implementing or to realizing some of the projects that we heard about today. So from funding, uh, which is very clearly operations funding in particular, is very clearly an acute need in our region to political will, um, infrastructure, coordination with other modes such as freight rail or highways. Um, what are kind of the biggest challenges uh, that you see your agency facing 
Um, and in answering it, um, try to think about if there are ways that um, people listening in today, our stakeholders, our partners, um, may be able to help, to help advocate, to help be a transit champion. Um, so uh, I guess we'll just keep, keep the same order, Metro first. Um, what are kind of the biggest challenges to realizing uh, the regional rail model that you shared about today? You know, I think David uh, had an oh. IT issue. He messaged me, so I guess I just start off that. Um, Thank you, Dan. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So, just from a service planning perspective, um, you know, there there are some 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 major challenges we do have. Um, let's kind of touch on a few that jump out in my mind initially. So, number one, Metro is a little bit unique compared to say CTA in that freight railroads actually own and operate on most of our lines. There's only a couple that we own and operate and dispatch completely. Uh, so that's certainly a, uh, this is a challenge, but it's a something we have to constantly collaborate with the freight companies that own that and something that, you know, it's it's always a process. So I know, for example, for that BNSF schedule change I mentioned earlier with the uh, filling that hour gap, I mean, BNSF was great partners with us. They were willing to work with us, and but it, it took a little bit of uh, work with them to engage them because they had both freight trains that they frankly have to run and then also uh, that to our gap they relied on for some of their maintenance away activities. So uh, I think one of the questions kind of alluded to this as well, that you know, there was a bit of a, um, a change to for, for their processes to be able to have hourly service on the line. And they think just you know, hourly service kind of a no brainer, but that was a you know something we had to work through, uh, monitor, make sure they had windows for both um, you know maintenance of way and their freight train. So it was a you know an effort, months long effort to work with them to just implement that one, you know, just fill that hour gap. So you can imagine if across the system, uh, it's not going to be something we just do overnight to implement, you know, hourly or half hourly or, or more frequent service. So it is, it is a, it is a challenge with that, and it's something we will have to work through. Um, other things too that you know that there are, um, just I think Metro is no, no uh, different than many other industries during the pandemic. There were some workforce concerns in terms of staffing. Uh, I think we're largely working through that now to maybe get to a level of kind of as pre-COVID service, but something we're not quite there yet. Um, and then there's, you know, things like this, you know, infrastructure. So we don't have, you know, we call it like three mains or triple track on many lines, which enables us to unlock some extra service potential, such as express trains, or uh, enable that, um, you know, that, that service that on, on midday is, you have three mains, it's certainly easier to contain, but have a freight train and passenger service at the same time. We don't have that across the system either. So each line has its infrastructure challenges too. So it is, you know, there are things that we'd have to work on through um, for, for, as a system. Um, in order to get there. And I think that's kind of the, or at least again, from my service planning perspective, I'm not sure if David's joined uh, back yet, but um, he's more of the, the long range planning side of things. But that's that's kind of the challenges we see uh, as a day to day basis as, as we kind of make those steps towards a regional rail type model. Yeah, apologies that uh, I got cut out uh, for a second, but I, I don't have a whole lot to add to Dan's response. Just I, I think the, the challenges that these things uh, will take time for us. And so uh, time, continued uh, continued investment, uh, and a work to uh, continue collaboration uh, with, with all of those partners. Thanks. From Pace's perspective, I think the biggest challenge we've always had is, is funding. You know, given the size of our service area, we, we simply just don't have the resources to provide the services that we, we would like to provide throughout the entire region. We're regularly asked uh, to make service improvements, service enhancements, and just given the, the breadth of our, our service area, we, we can't always uh, accommodate those requests. So funding is, is always a, a big challenge. And but I would encourage those who are on this call today, you know, one of the things that um, you know, is projected to occur in 2026 is the fiscal cliff. We have a projected $730 million budget shortfall. I would encourage uh, people to, that wish to support public transit to reach out to your legislators to encourage them to support transit and provide more funding for transit so that we can continue to provide um, the services that the, the region needs and, and wants uh, going forward. And speaking for the RLE project, um, we have made tremendous progress in advancing the project uh, over the past few years. And with the support of stakeholders, partners, and advocates, we have been able to secure $959 million in transit TIF funding 
that will be part of the local match. And um, it we are very that support and wouldn't be possible um, to come this far without that support. So thanks everyone, whoever is on this call. Um, and then Congress has also appropriated 350 million in um, for your 2024 CIG funding for RLE. And both these accomplishments demonstrate the local and federal support for the project, which is very important for a capital project of this um, magnitude. The next big milestone is receiving the full funding grant agreement from FTA. And with the transitive funding and the um, planning and engineering work that we have been doing so far, we are well positioned and optimistic for receiving that next year. Um, we have also been coordinating with railroads to execute agreements where we uh, need their right of way or their concurrence on designs to build the project. So although we won't be uh, operating on the right of way, we still um, have some interface with them in order to build this uh, mega project. Thank you. Excellent. Um, we are at uh, just past one. Thank you so much uh, to Daniel and David, Eric and Sonali um, from sharing about these with, the, with us about these projects today. Uh, please, uh, if you're on the call still, join us next week um, and in the, uh, the two following Tuesdays after that uh, as the series continues. Um, with that, we will close the first session of Transportation Tuesdays. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.